to you all, those of you here in the building and those of you worshipping with us online. And it's good to see you wherever you are in the world, because uh, we do have those folk who are with us from other parts of the world than Glasgow. So nice to see those faces on screen this morning too. There's one or two things to uh, bring to your attention, uh, some um, notices. The church is doing the best we can at the moment to continue to serve the community and to keep some things going. So some things have started up and we're trying to keep them going. And they are open to anybody and everybody who wants to attend. So this Monday, we have the Moments Cafe across from Trinity from 2 till 3.30. So that will be that happening, that service to the community. It's a safe place. There might be people you know who you'd like to make a suggestion to them. This would be a good place for them to be, a good safe place. And it might be that it appeals to you. So that's happening on Monday afternoon. A Wednesday morning services. Again, the numbers are growing. And wouldn't it be fantastic if we had people coming to that service who weren't already part of a worshipping fellowship? It might be that you want to invite somebody every Wednesday morning at half past 10. And we won't be taking a break for Christmas because we don't break Sundays. So we won't be breaking on the Wednesdays. The Renew Wellbeing Cafe is beginning to welcome in people who are part of the local community. 10 to 12 on a Thursday morning. Anybody is welcome to go along. There, last week, there were people knitting little hats for Ferrere Rocher sweets. Um, there were people painting. Um, some were good and some weren't, but that was fine. They, they were doing that. There were people playing games. There were people coloring in. There were people working in the garden with heavy equipment. Well, it's heavy to me. Um, you know, saws and all sorts of things that if you want to talk to Eric about, he can explain what they were using. All of these things going on around the Baptist church on a Thursday morning. A place to meet others, a safe space. So that's happening. And that will be continuing through the Christmas period too. Because we know that Christmas can be a very lonely time for some people. So that cafe will be continuing right the way through. So these things are happening as well as our usual prayer breakfast next Saturday morning and worship. So here in the morning, Cross and Trinity at night, lots of opportunities. And I guess my question is, do you know people who you could invite to become part of some of these opportunities? Because that's part of our witness and part of our service. Also, as part of our um, serving and helping within the, the, the local fellowship, we are hoping to put the tree up, the Christmas tree up, in the back here at the close of the service today. Now, we already have four of us who are happy to do it. If anybody else would like to join, you know, a couple of extra hands would be fine. We can watch our distancing and just get the tree erected so that we have it up for next week. So if anybody's willing to do that and you've got the time, please just stay behind at the end of the service. That sense that lots is happening. We are doing all that we can. Why? Because we are to be lights in our community. And our community needs light. Our city needs light. The light of Christ. The world needs light that light. The light that brings peace, that brings hope, even in the dark times. Let's reflect upon that as we watch a video that helps us to think about peace. Now, this video was produced at a time when Advent was a time when people got caught up in parties and decorations. And actually, the government told us we should have our office parties and our parties and all these things. So many people are getting caught up in that way of thinking again. 
Let's watch, let's listen. And as the video plays, Leslie will invite Advent candles for us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We give thanks for the peace we can know as followers of Jesus. That sense that you are with us no matter the circumstances, that you are in control. We can trust you. Thank you that you bring us to that point of peace very often as we worship you. So the world stops for a moment or two. And we come into your intimate presence and know that you are with us. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your promises. For promises given many years before Jesus was born. We give thanks for those promises that Jesus came not just for his own people, but for the whole human race. Thank you for those promises that said Jesus would come, the Messiah would come to set us free from all that enslaves us. Thank you for those promises that eternal life is found through Jesus, your son, our Lord. Lord God, we give you thanks for these promises and we give you thanks for your promise to be with us always. And we give thanks that your future promises, those still to be fulfilled, are for blessing, are for goodness, are for glory, are for peace, are for a relationship with you and your continual presence. We thank you for the reminder that we think of especially at this season that Jesus will come again and there will be a new beginning and a new heaven and a new earth and sin will be eradicated and all will be as you intended. And how we look forward to that day, that day of no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more wrong peace with you. Lord God, as we worship you this morning, wherever we are, may we experience the deep peace of Christ that refreshes, that renews, that restores. Help us to rest in your presence and to know your peace as we worship. Amen. We sing together an Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Our reading is from Isaiah 9, but it's in video form. So you're going to listen to the words. It's straight from Isaiah 9, if you have a Bible open in front of you. But the images help us to see a little bit about the pain and the suffering that was to happen before Jesus was born. So let's listen and watch Isaiah chapter 9, the opening verses. My apologies to those of you in the building. I was expecting the words to come up. Uh, not quite sure why they didn't on that particular clip. And I think it might have helped if we'd had the lights off because it's quite a dark clip. Those of you who are watching at home had none of those problems. You'd have seen uh, very well that it was the birth of a child and the pain of that birth. And then we had that wonderful sound of the child's cry as that pain was over. Now, Isaiah wrote these words, the words we've just heard, a very dark time in Judah's history, in his people's history. He looked back to the good times, the times of King David, and he longed for another godly king. The king who was on the throne at the time was far from godly, King Ahaz. And he refused to listen 
to what Isaiah was saying, and he refused to listen to God, and he went his own way. Isaiah's people were walking in darkness. There wasn't a, a godly leader to show them the way to go. And they knew well the, the threats that surrounded them, the enemies who were prepared to overtake them, to overthrow them, to destroy them. And Isaiah, in all of this, and he was caught up in that too, he knew that God would keep his promise. That's what Isaiah held on to, that God would keep his promise to maintain David's line, even though the current king was not godly. And Isaiah believed that God would raise up at some time another king like David. A king who looked, who sought for God's heart. But Isaiah had no idea when that would happen. And I imagine his heart's longing was that it would be in his time. You know, God, could you please do this quickly? But he didn't know. But he trusted and he knew he would have to wait. Now, as I was thinking about Isaiah and the time in which he lived, I couldn't help but look at our own society. I don't just mean Glasgow, I mean the world as a whole. But if we look, say at the moment, for, at Scotland, what do we see? We see a decline of the church. You know, we see a church that appears to be crumbling, that appears to not be reaching communities as it should, not sharing the gospel effectively. We know that across our land, God's teachings are not being upheld by the majority of people. And God's teachings are being ignored by many in authority. Many who will even use the name of God inappropriately in interview, blaspheming. The name of God is dishonored so often, as is the name of Jesus. And there are people walking in darkness in our day. They don't necessarily know it. But of course, there are many who do know they're in dark places. I read this interesting quote about our society. It said, we're much too educated to believe in miracles. But we swallow the most amazing hodgepodge of superstition and paganism. And then we're surprised at the rapid increase of spiritual darkness all around us. Oh, miracles. No, you explain them away. They don't happen today. You'll have heard people say that. And you'll have heard of people who've had their cards read, who slavishly listen to their horoscopes, who are fascinated in what we might call the dark side of the world. That's the world we inhabit. That's the world in which we are called to witness. And it's very easy for us to slip into that sense of hopelessness. Well, what can we do? We just have to live through it. And maybe when we're sitting alongside someone who feels they are in a place of extreme darkness, and there are many of them, who see no hope, no light, sometimes we might feel we can be dragged down to where they are rather than being able to bring light into their situation. Isaiah felt the pain of his people. He knew it. He could see it. But he had hope. That's what marked him out as different. He had hope because of his trust in God. And that's what we should all be longing for and seeking that we, like Isaiah, 
can speak a message, can share a message that might not be accepted, that might not be liked, but that is true. Isaiah spoke, and he had no idea when God would act. But he spoke of a time when the shackles of slavery would be broken, when the enemy would be defeated, when God again would be honored, and when peace would be restored. And he said it would happen through the birth of a child, the gift of a son. Which is strange, really, because birth is an everyday occurrence, isn't it? Right now, there are babies being born. I can't remember how many seconds it is, but it's every few seconds another life is brought into the world. So why is it that Isaiah spoke of the birth of a son? A son who was to carry responsibility. A son who was going to have a kingdom with no end. A son whose kingdom would be shown through justice and righteousness. That's what Isaiah wrote about. And he gave names to this king, this baby who was born to be king. And we hear the titles every Christmas. So what do they mean? Wonderful Counselor. A counselor. One who has wisdom, who has insight, who can guide. But wonderful. Full of wonder. Amazing. Awesome. There's something beyond normal in this baby to be born. Something supernatural. He is not an ordinary child. And God's wisdom is an intrinsic part of his nature. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. This child is given a title, Mighty God. Isaiah believed in one God. That's the Jewish tradition. And yet he's calling this child Mighty God. So this child is God in human form. That's what Isaiah is saying. He's not an alternative. He is God. And he's everlasting father. A permanent father. And we think of the role of a good father who cares, who protects, who provides, who disciplines, who encourages his children to live well. Well, that's what this baby born to be king will do. He'll guide and care for his family and lead them on the right path. And Isaiah said he would be called Prince of Peace. He's going to bring wholeness and well-being. That's part of his role. Now we hear these words every Christmas. We sing them. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those were the names that Isaiah used. And they weren't names that were commonly used to describe a king, let alone a baby. So did Isaiah know that he was writing about Jesus? That's an unanswerable question, isn't it? We read Jesus into what Isaiah wrote. Did he know that? Or did he just know that God would, at the right time, provide the rescuer, 
provide this king. And that was Isaiah's trust and hope. This is what God would do. This is what God revealed to him. Isaiah believed that God would act and that God's passion, his love for people would make this birth possible. Now God, on the other hand, was using Isaiah to prepare his people. And, and God was using Isaiah to reveal to generations who would come long after, like ourselves, that this was all part of God's plan. In the second half of the 8th century, before Jesus was born, God placed this thinking, these words, into Isaiah. And Isaiah spoke them and recorded them. And Isaiah wrote this down because he knew it was a message from God. And whether or not he saw it fulfilled, he knew he had a duty to share the message. God had a plan. There was hope. And I find that quite incredible. Now, maybe I shouldn't find it incredible. But I do. I find it incredible that God could speak to a human being and give them this insight that was recorded for us to show that Jesus was always God's rescue plan. He was no afterthought. This was what God intended to do generations before it happened. The world is in a mess. There's injustice, there's cruelty, there's inequality. We have only had to read the papers this week to see that. But God is still in control. And his plan is still being worked out. And that's our hope. Just as it was Isaiah's hope. Let's praise God as we sing together. Jesus, God's righteousness revealed.
Craig is going to read for us. He's going to read again from Isaiah, this time from chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Thank you, Craig. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Thank you, Craig. So Isaiah continues to write about Jesus. And Isaiah's prophecy goes back before David. Did you notice that? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was King David's father. Now, Jesse was an ordinary man from Bethlehem. He was a man who had sheep. He had a man who had a family. And David was his youngest son. But Jesse didn't ever father sons expecting that one of them would become king. He expected that they would work the land with him. He was surprised when his youngest son, David, was selected by God to be the king that the people desired. Humble beginnings from Bethlehem to king. An interesting parallel, isn't it? An ordinary father who fathered a child, although he didn't technically father Jesus, but became father to a child. And the responsibility that was on Joseph's shoulders. So Isaiah takes us back to Bethlehem, and he takes us back to an ordinary man. How interesting. God at work inspiring Isaiah yet again. David's line hadn't proved faithful. David himself hadn't proved to be the faithful king that he'd wanted to be. We know that. Human kings and human leaders easily become proud and arrogant they can abuse their power. They build up their own empires, their own reputations. We see it around the world today. And David was no different at times. But the king that God promised goes back before David's mistakes to Jesse. It's a new start. And Isaiah prophesied, he spoke of this king who would be equipped through the breath of God, the spirit of God, the ruach of God. He would have the very nature of God. He would have understanding, wise counsel, righteousness, justice, all these words that are so important, all these characteristics that a king needs. We've heard them before. But in chapter 11, Isaiah adds fear of the Lord and faithfulness. This king is going to be in awe of God 
more in awe of God than any other leader, than any other hu- than any human, than any power or principality. And this king is going to be faithful, faithful regardless. We think of all the times that Jesus was tempted to go his own way or to do what Satan wanted, not to go through with death on the cross. All those temptations, this king, Isaiah said, will remain faithful. He'll be trustworthy. He'll be true. He'll give decisions for the poor of the earth. He'll be pro the poor and the downtrodden and the downcast and those in need. It's not that he's going to ignore the rest, but his heart is very much going to be for those who are the poor and the vulnerable. How different to many of our world leaders today who see the poor almost as dispensable. Well, it's their tough lot, isn't it? This king will value them, will make time for them, will spend time with them, and will give them a place in his kingdom. That's what Isaiah said. And this king's words will be powerful. The wicked, they'll be brought down. What a promise. And what a promise at a time when Isaiah was living, when wickedness was seen all around. The wicked will be brought down. Now, brought down, yeah, that could mean slayed. And we know that ultimately death and death without Christ is what will happen to those who reject Jesus and continue to walk in the way of wickedness. But we also know that the wicked can be brought down to their knees to change, to have a change of heart. And that's what we should be praying for. Isaiah is speaking of a kingdom that is to come. A kingdom that will have no end. A kingdom in which the righteousness of God will be revealed, as we've just sung. God is planning something new, says Isaiah. And preparations are in hand. All those years before Jesus' birth. Wow. That's how I feel. When I read these words, wow. If God revealed something to me, would I react the way that Isaiah did with faithfulness and record it and pass it on? Now, he's not asking me, I don't think, to do that. But you get the idea. Or would we say, oh, I can't do that. Don't ask that of me. Oh no, I must have got it wrong. Isaiah was convicted by God and he faithfully recorded what God placed on his heart so that we could read it and be amazed at God's plan and God's preparation. Which had me then wondering about Revelation. Because revelation is the part of Scripture that we have not yet seen revealed. We've not seen that part of the plan fulfilled. Do we believe it? I think we're okay. I want to read a couple of uh, verses from Revelation just now. Just now. And, and when you think about them and when you're listening to them, think about them as God's plan not yet come to pass. So Revelation 19 from verse 11. Now John wrote, this is what he saw. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse 
whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one, but, that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then in chapter 21, at verse 5, He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Write this down, John was told. Write this down, as what Isaiah did. That we would see and we would hear and we would believe. Now God's plans and God's preparation include a new heaven and a new earth under the kingship of Jesus, the one in David's line, the shoot from Jesse's stump. Are we living hopefully, believing that this part of God's plan will come to pass? Do we engage with this strange part of Scripture that we call Revelation? This vision, this prophecy that was given but has not yet been fulfilled. How many people heard Isaiah's prophecy and disregarded it, poo-pooed it? It'll never happen. Is that how we react to the prophecy that we've been given, that hasn't yet been fulfilled? The Prince of Peace, Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the one we worship. He's the one we celebrate at Christmas. Not just what he has done, but what he's still to do. Amen. Let's spend some time 
reflecting on what's in our hearts. We're going to have a piece of music. It's come, Prince of Peace. That quiet reflection. Are we ready to receive Jesus? Whether he comes as a, as a child or as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Are we in a good place with him? Or do we need to use this Advent to draw closer to him? To worship him more deeply? To listen to him more carefully? It's a question for each one of us to reflect later today. Let's praise God together as we sing, O great God of highest heaven. to take some time to pray. I'd like you to think of news articles that have really touched your heart this week, whether you've listened on the radio, watched on television, or read in a paper. What has offended you, upset you, grieved you about our world? going to make time to pray about that. And what has delighted you? Has there been anything in the news that has brought you a sense of joy and thanksgiving? Maybe that's harder. But there are good things happening. Maybe we have to look more locally for them. So we're going to take some time in for our own personal prayer just now and bring to God those things that you've seen and heard that have distressed you and you know in your heart they have distressed him. Let's pray.
Lord God, the news is about abuse, killings, neglect, lack of resources, armies on the move, power being abused, decisions that seem somewhat dodgy, world leaders changing, world leaders floundering. There's a great sense of unease and unsettledness. Nations are speaking against nations. And we long to see your light and your love and your healing and your reconciliation. Lord God, we've seen pictures of children, children abused by those who are given responsibility to care and to love. And we're sad and we're angry. And there's nothing we can do to change that situation. But help us be willing to make a stand when it's called for. Help us to be willing to be listening ears, caring people, good neighbors, kind friends wise family members. Help us not to turn our ears from those things that are distasteful when you're asking us to do something about it. We pray against the violence that we see in our society. Violence that is rife in the east end of our city. Young people assaulting one another, attempting murder, committing murder because of gang culture, because of the availability of weapons. And we pray for change. We pray for your light and your peace to break through. We pray about the huge drug problem we have in our city. Many people who are addicted to various types of drug and whose addiction has got such a hold that they have a skewed reality of life. We pray for all agencies working to help and we pray for your light to break through the darkness of addiction. We think about migrants, wherever they may be in the world, those fleeing from danger, from oppression, from persecution, willing to take immense risks to get to a place of safety. Lord God, we do pray for those places of safety, that doors would be open. But we pray too for change in the lands that migrants come from. That there would be a willingness to love and to care and not to oppress. We think of families living without power in our own land just now. And we pray for all the help that they require. Pray that it would arrive in good time. We pray for the poor and the vulnerable across your world, thinking especially this morning about the Yemen and Afghanistan and all the abuse and the atrocities that have taken place and are taking place in those lands. We pray for change. We pray for all who work for justice 
and work to meet need. Lord God, we look at our world and there is so much that is dark. But we thank you for all the signs of love and hope and peace. We thank you for neighbors reaching out a hand, for people helping strangers, for those who are generous with all they have, for those who seek to love like Jesus. We give thanks for those who are willing to forgive and not to harbor grudges. And we pray for all who work in Jesus' name to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring light. Lord God, help us to see you at work and not to despair in the dark times, but trust to trust that they will end. Give thanks for all you have placed on our hearts this morning. Help us to be faithful in our witness, in our service, in our praise. Through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our final praise is in video form. Wonderful, merciful Savior. And let's bless one another as we say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen.